So, is patience real happiness? First, we need to have an understanding of what that expression, real happiness, is, especially as Sharon Salzberg used it in writing her book called Real Happiness. We're speaking about a happiness that is sustainable, that in a sense regenerates itself, that is easily maintained, as opposed to those peaks of joy and delight, which of course are wonderful. But real happiness, in the, from the Buddhist perspective, has a sense of equanimity about it. It is not the kind of happiness that brings us way up in a high only to let us fall crashing down again a moment later. It's developing a sense of ease and a level of happiness, as I said, that, that sustains. No one is happy all the time. So we're not talking about zzz, happy, 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 I'm a meditator, I float on my cushion, nothing disturbs me. That's not realistic. But it, it has more of a feeling of this, you know, everything is always changing. Not just because the Buddha taught it, but because science today is confirming that. Everything is changing, everything is in motion. Science says that everything is vibrating. In fact, some of them actually state that by saying everything is vibration. And I don't question that. It's just, you know, I'm, you know, maybe not young enough to understand that this isn't solid. You know, I'm still thinking this is a solid table and I can put this cup on it and it doesn't go like that. But I believe them. Everything is in motion. Certainly, everything is changing. So we can either figure out how to go with that sense of change, that flow, or we can be living in resistance. And that's exhausting. It's difficult. That doesn't mean that everything that comes up is just fine. A lot that comes up is not fine. But much more than we would like to believe is beyond our control to change. So we need to learn how to accept, and then we also need to learn how, learn how to discern what is not acceptable. So that's where we come right to the point of what we're looking at today. My conclusion is, much as I'm deeply into patience, which is why I wrote a book about it, but my conclusion is that the answer to that question would be no, patience is not real happiness. Patience is a very essential element of real happiness. Certainly when we feel impatient, we are not really happy in that moment. For whatever reason that impatience has arisen, it's not a very pleasant moment. So, <clears throat> from my perspective, if patience is not real happiness, and I was going to single out one quality, my conclusion is that I would end up with wisdom. Reason being, the Buddha taught that there are three poisons with which we have to deal in life. He said they were greed, hatred, and delusion. And from one perspective, I think that greed and hatred are forms of delusion. So I really end up with delusion, but let's deal with greed and hatred equally. Greed, of course, is um, a quality that has many, many tributaries. Um, greed is grasping and clinging and wanting and endless desire. And of course the greed that is stingy, that doesn't want to part with, that can open one's heart to someone who we don't understand, um, whose color of skin is different, whose clothes are different, whose language is different. We can't open our purse to someone in need. These are all forms of greed. 
And some of that, of course, carries over into hatred and its many tributaries. Uh, anger, fear, resentment, bitterness. All of these, when we think about them, we can see why the Buddha caused these poisons. Because when they're active within our mind and body, they're toxic. My feeling that, they're, uh, that these are all forms of delusion is that they're all forms of not seeing things clearly. Or in the actual terminology of this tradition, not seeing things as they really are. When we do not see things as they really are, Buddhists define that as delusion. To see things as they really are is defined as wisdom. So the Buddha also said that wisdom is the ultimate enlightening factor. When we see things as they really are, we're really well on our way. The issue for us human beings, all of us not quite fully enlightened beings, any exceptions to that? There may be one. Um, it's certainly not me. Uh, the issue that we deal with is habit energy and our conditioning, our conditioned way of thinking, our reactive behavior. And these are very powerful forces. Habit energy is powerful. Our conditioned thinking and our conditioned behavior has an enormous amount of energy. So even if we see clearly this is the way things really are, we still are going to have a pull to speak from our habitual way of speaking and reacting in our conditioned fashion. This doesn't, by the way, make us a bad person. It just simply means it's part of what we deal with as human beings trying to move toward a greater state of being fully awake. A fully awakened being, fully awakened being, is called a Buddha. Buddha simply means awakened being. So, wisdom, one says, well, fine, I mean, there are ways to practice patience, there are ways to practice generosity, there are ways to practice relinquishing, there are ways to practice loving kindness, to practice truthfulness, etc. How do you practice wisdom? Doesn't wisdom have to evolve within us? And the answer to that is yes, but the way that we practice is to create conditions, causes and conditions that will allow wisdom to arise. And the way that the Buddha taught primarily was the practice of vipassana, insight meditation, to see things as they really are. So when we practiced a few moments ago this practice of opening the field of awareness, that's called vipassana. And I'm sure you noticed that as you were aware of a thought that came up, how easy it was to go with what the thought was about. Because it's interesting. And it's what we're used to doing. That's the content. And it does take practice to stay with just what the mind is doing, the bare experience of what the mind is doing, which is its nature to have a constant arising of thoughts, feelings, and sensations, one after another. And today, again, research has shown that what the Buddha was teaching was really right on target. That a thought if we watch it arise and pass away and do not cling to it in any way, has a very short lifespan, maybe 1.2 seconds. A feeling, maybe just over 3 seconds. 
And this they come to by hooking up these electro kind of things and watching what's going on inside. So you might say, well, yeah, but how come if I have this feeling of being really annoyed first thing in the morning and I feel really annoyed all day long, how can you say that a feeling has such a short lifespan? When in my experience, I can feel annoyed all day, I can feel happy all day, I can feel sad all day. Well, that is about clinging and grasping, even if it's done in very subtle ways. And this is what the Buddha, when he was teaching, singled out as the source of dukkha. You know the word dukkha? Translated as suffering, unhappiness, unsatisfactoriness, all levels of it from major suffering all the way through to very, very, very subtle unrest. Whatever that is that's there, lying on the beach in the Bahamas, on vacation, watching a gorgeous sunset with someone you really care about right by your side, and yet you're aware of some little something that still goes through there. And the Buddha called that dukkha, very subtle dukkha. So wisdom arises, becomes enhanced, perpetuates with this kind of insight, which is to see the nature of mind, because that is where our experience is. Wisdom is not knowledge. It is not fame, it's not success. Wisdom is hard-earned. We could actually conclude these few minutes tonight with what Confucius taught. He said, we come by wisdom in three ways. The first is by imitation, which is the easiest. The second is by contemplation, which is the noblest. And the third is by experience, which is the bitterest. <laughs>